Good evening, everybody. This is the fourth debate, the fourth uh, LCIA LSE arbitration debate. Um, these are interesting times, uh, not in the least because you see me here by myself and not with Jan Klein Heisterkamp, who for the last four years um, has, together with me, announced the opening of our um, moot. I'm happy to announce that he's not been struck with coronavirus, but he is unfortunately not able to join me here today to welcome you to this event. Five years ago, um, when Stefan and I discussed potentially at some point having uh, a Vienna moot on the basis of the LCIA rules, we also discussed the proliferation of pre-moots, and there was a small pre-moot here in London, and we were delighted that the LSE um, was willing and able to uh, take us on as partner in crime, if you will, to make the London pre-moot one of the preeminent pre-moots in the world, reflecting, hopefully, the preeminence of London as, according to Queen Mary's, the premier arbitration seat in the world. Um, so we've had five, this is the fifth pre-moot, it is the fourth uh, pre-moot debate, because we thought we would commemorate the um, annual pre-moot with something special, where we would showcase some of the best and the brightest of the advocates and the council that either are based in London or come to London to, um, to, to be involved in arbitrations. 2020 is a very special year because it is the year that the moot is, or should I say, was going to use the LCA rules. Uh, we are having this pre-moot here this weekend. It is probably the last physical pre-moot because sadly today the organizers have announced that the Vienna moot will not take place physically. Uh, the organizers are still exploring whether or not there will be uh, some virtual variety of the moot, but it won't be quite the same. So if nothing else, it is encouragement for us to make this weekend especially special and for the students to have as many parties as they can, because it is about showcasing what they have learned over the last few weeks and months, but also to enjoy to spend time together, um, which I hope they will be able to do so in London. It is, it is sad, but it is also interesting to see that in an, in an environment, in a society where we are increasingly traveling, um, all of a sudden there is something external like this virus scare. Maybe it is not such a bad thing to be confronted with reality. How far should we take this? Is it sustainable what we are currently doing? Of course, it's not great that this virus is the trigger, but maybe rethinking some of our habits is not only a bad thing. Um, what Stefan didn't know when he spoke to me today is that it's also a very special year for the LCA this year because we have new rules coming out in the next month or so. So I'm going to put in a pitch for the LCA rules to be used in, I think, three years or something would be a, a good schedule. But Stefan and I will talk about that after he's had a drink tonight. That leads me to introducing to you today's um, uh, panelists. We have a very special crew in recognition of the fact that this is the 2020 debate. We have Wendy Miles QC, who is in quarantine, but apart from that is uh, also a very prolific and fantastic advocate and arbitrator, based here in London, but originally from New Zealand. So very much the common law tradition. Then on the other side, we have Professor Dr. Stefan Kroll, who is a very interesting and relevant combination, combining academic skills and academic efforts um, uh, with his work at the uh, Bucerius Law School in Hamburg, with his work as an arbitrator in Germany and elsewhere, and having spent a lot of time here in England as well, but still I would qualify him as a civil law lawyer. They are going to be debating under the supervision and guidance of no one else than our own president of the LCIA, Paula Hodges QC, who is um, the head of Herbert Smith Free Hills arbitration practice. We are delighted that she is here for this special session of the LCA pre -moot. Paula and your team, it is over to you.
good evening, everybody. And as you probably know, the purpose of the debate is to actually explore some differences, stroke similarities between the approach under common law traditions and civil law traditions to various matters of procedure and evidence. We've decided to use the um, facts from the Vismut problem this year as the basic factual synopsis that underlies this debate. So bear with me while I give you my own little summary of the rather long moot problem that all the students have got. So it concerns a claim that defective turbines were sold by Turbina Energia to Hydro N, the supplier of a hydro power plant to the Council of Greenacre, which is in a remote region of Mediterranean. So I hope you're all paying attention because I've got a lot more to say. Um, hydro N guaranteed to Greenacre that the hydro power plant would be available for at least 11 months each year in order to produce at least 600 megawatts of renewable energy in line with Greenacre's aim to reduce carbon emissions. So it's quite a trendy subject up to the minute, so you can all be thinking of your ESG comments later. But if the hydro um, power plant was not available, there were liquidated damages um, to be charged of um, US dollars 40,000 a day. But recently, the press has reported that Trusted Quality Steel, one of the main steel suppliers to Tabina Energia, has been accused of delivering low-quality steel to its customers as part of a fraudulent scheme involving forged quality certificates. The reports also refer to this being the likely reason why turbines supplied to another hydropower plant have had to be replaced due to excessive corrosion and cavitation damage after only two years of operation. Turbina Energia has been unable to confirm whether inferior steel was used in manufacturing the turbines that were supplied to Hydra N and has suggested that they are merely inspected after two years of operation. Needless to say, Hydro N has rejected this proposal and, remand, and demanded that the turbines be replaced within two years in accordance with the wishes of its end customer, Greenacre. Uh, Turbina Energy has refused to replace the turbines without first undertaking an inspection and so Hydro-N has lost patience and quite rightly started an LCIA arbitration, um, seeking replacement of the turbines and damages as compensation for any uh, liquidated damages it has to pay to Greenacre for lost production. So you've probably already realised that a key issue in the LCIA arbitration is for the tribunal to determine whether the turbines supplied by Tabina Energia were manufactured from inferior steel and are susceptible to excessive corrosion or cavitation damage, with the result that the turbines are not fit for purpose, etc. This will require expert evidence, and the debate is going to focus on the timing and manner in which the expert evidence should be adduced. So the first topic is whether the tribunal should appoint an expert itself or whether the party should be entitled to submit evidence from experts of their own choosing. And then the second issue is whether the expert evidence should be heard at the beginning of the proceedings or in the more traditional um, manner after statements of case have been exchanged. So Wendy and Stefan are going to explore these issues from a common law and civil law perspective during the debate. To enliven the evening, I have encouraged them to make their submissions with passion and vigor so that we can explore the pros and cons in a lively manner. And so I have been asked to make a disclaimer on their behalf 
And some of the submissions you hear are not necessarily those that they would make in a live arbitration as advocates for their own clients. I hope that means that there'll be some very interesting submissions made this evening. At the end, I'm going to make an on-the-spot decision as to who has been more persuasive, but if there's time, I'm also going to seek some views from the floor. So please stay awake, stand ready, and now the debate will begin. And so, Wendy, will you kick us off on the first topic, please? Absolutely. Thank you very much, Paula. Thank you, Jackie. Um, thank you to the organisers. Passion and vigour, what better place to start than with that famous common law arbitrator, Mr Doug Jones? <laughs> he said in a recent article, a very recent article published by the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, that the prevalence... Oh, is this working? The microphone? Yes. Good. Yes. The prevalence... I'd hate you to miss any of my passion or vigour. The, the prevalence of, this was Doug Jones, the prevalence of party appointed experts in international arbitration highlights the differences between the approaches to presenting evidence in common and civil law. As party appointed experts are rarely used in domestic pleadings, uh, proceedings in civil law jurisdictions, counsel and arbitrators from the civil law may be unfamiliar with reforms to the use of party appointed experts to the forms in common law jurisdictions undertaken to maximize impartiality and efficiency. So this quote tells us two things. It tells us, first of all, that party-appointed arbitrators, uh, party-appointed experts are indeed prevalent in international arbitration proceedings. But it also tells us that civil lawyers are not as familiar with that as common lawyers are. So we don't need Mr. Jones, esteemed and indeed passionate and vigorous though he is, to tell us that party-appointed experts are indeed prevalent in international arbitration. We know that from practice, but we also know it from the IBA rules, the IBA rules for the taking of evidence in international arbitration. Now, those rules are fairly universally accepted in arbitration proceedings, even if they're not formally followed they really have come to form norms in the way we practice and in our procedure. And Article 5 of those rules provide that parties may use party-appointed experts. There do not appear to be any exceptions to this permission um, in the language of the IBA rules. The use of party-appointed experts or the choice to use party-appointed experts is in the gift of the parties themselves. Now, Article 6 of those rules does, of course, provide also, and in my submission secondarily, does come after 5, for the tribunal to appoint tribunal-appointed experts, but only following consultation with the parties. So there's not the same absolute entitlement. So if we needed anything further, we also have the Queen Mary White and Case Survey back in 2012 which said use of party-appointed experts, it concluded from surveying users of international arbitration that you, the use of party-appointed uh, experts has indeed become the norm in international arbitration. So there's good reasons for this, and the norm shouldn't be deviated from, Madam Chair, in the case before us. Um, and let me just take you through five of those reasons, and there's many more. First, in international arbitration, as in common law judicial systems, the development of the factual record is primarily the responsibility of the parties. We do not rely on the tribunal to conduct its own independent fact-finding. In fact, in international arbitration, that would be inappropriate. This is the nature of our adversarial system. The advocates present their case most effectively when they have control over the experts. Second, this is a private dispute resolution process, not a domestic national court, be it a civil court or a common law court. As a private process, it's paid for by the parties. Parties pay counsel of their choosing. Parties pay for an administering institution, of course, the, IB, the LCIA, of their choosing. And for the most part, they pay for the arbitrators of their choosing. They should not lose that party autonomy when it comes to the all-important factor of the expert of their choosing. 
and nor should they be required to pay for additional and in my submission unnecessary resource for a tribunal to appoint an expert on top of those costs. So third, do I have time for my last three? Yes. Thank you. Third, I'll be quick. It's the parties and their counsel who know the case best, especially at the early stage of the case. It's the counsel and the parties who know precisely what type of expertise is required. One mechanical engineer may not have the same specialist expertise as another mechanical engineer, just as one lawyer may not have this, the same expertise as another. The parties may well have different views in their claims and their defences as to what particular type of expertise is required. It may depend on how they characterise those claims and defences, and that itself may evolve throughout the proceedings. So with respect, the tribunal is not currently at this early stage in a position to predetermine that by appointing a single expert with specific expertise of its choosing that it can resolve the expert issues in dispute. There's a considerable risk that such course might, in fact, cause a predetermination of some of the issues in dispute. So fourth, it's simply more effective for the parties to choose and work with their own party-appointed experts. Indeed, doing so may even lead to early resolution of the dispute. And after all, what we're all here for is resolution of disputes. Or at minimum, it may lead to narrowing of the issues. So as parties prepare their fact witnesses and their fact witness statements, and they work with the experts regarding those facts, they'll be equipped to take a deeper dive into the issues in dispute and better understand those at the preparatory stage. And if indeed a technical matter turns out to be quite straightforward when it's boiled down and understood, that may, as I say, result in a resolution of the dispute. So fifth and finally, coming back to my first point, this is an adversarial process in international arbitration. It's not an inquisitorial process. We know that because each side in this case intends, welcome, there's seats in the front if you'd like. <laughs> Um, because each side in this case intends to submit factual witness statements, written factual witness statements. That is a feature of common law systems. So that's how the fact evidence is going to be adduced. The parties are going to prepare and adduce the factual evidence in this case. It's not for the members of the tribunal to adduce those facts through an inquisitorial process. Although they may, and of course we hope they do, ask questions of the witnesses in the course of the hearing. But counsel for both parties will expect to be permitted to cross-examine the other side's fact witnesses, and indeed the IBA rules for the taking of evidence permit that too. So it's part and parcel of that same process for the parties to be able to work closely with their independent experts in order to understand the technical issues, as I said, and to be able to cross-examine one another's experts. We can't adopt half the adversarial system in respect of the facts and at half the inquisitorial system when it comes to the experts. That will lead to unnecessary and unintended inefficiency, confusion and cost. The facts are what inform the expert opinion and vice versa. And this holistic approach to the preparation of the case can only be achieved if counsel are permitted to appoint their own party appointed experts. I have some additional suggestions for a way forward that may get my civil law counterpart comfortable with party appointed experts, but I could keep them for reply. I, I, I think you should keep them for reply, but then I will allow Professor Crawl a rebuttal <coughs> if necessary. Okay. But over to you now, Professor Crawl, and we want you to deal with the submissions on inefficiency confusion and extra cost, please. First of all, thank you very much for having me here. And I'm surprised that you invite a German for passion. Uh, so I assume you insisted on the bigger part. And the Germans are fairly well known for bigger. And um, I was surprised to hear that presentation. And I know I'm doing an apple battle here, yeah? being one of the few civil law uh, lawyers here in a room with full of common law lawyers and the presentation I heard was the presentation I would have heard when I did my internship at Herbert Smith. <laughs> uh, so from people telling me about the white book in arbitration. In my view, there is a good thing to be said about 
not party-appointed experts completely, but a good thing to be said about tribunal-appointed experts. And the way you presented the tribunal-appointed experts is not really the way we would appoint a tribunal-appointed expert in a civil law arbitration or in an arbitration conducted in a way which is cost-efficient. Because what we would do is largely we would wait for the first submission, the first round of submission, like in the case here, and then sit down with the parties and try to elaborate a working schedule for the tribunal appointed expert on the basis of what they have submitted so far, if there's a proper request for arbitration, which gives you some indications. What is the downside of party appointed experts is they are just hired guns. So in principle, you end up as an arbitrator with one party saying A, the other party saying B, at the end of it, you are as clever as you were before. That was what actually happened in that arbitration, the cavitation issue coming from a real arbitration where we had two tribunal appointed experts, uh, sorry, two party appointed experts, which presented completely opposite ways without any guidance by the tribunal and later on a tribunal appointed expert which was then questioned or by the parties with the help of their party appointed experts, we would have been at the end of the proceedings as clever as at the beginning of the proceedings. Because a lot of these issues, fact, a lot of these technical issues are so complicated that it depends really on the starting point. And I'm pretty sure that no one in the room here has had a party appointed expert who wrote an opinion or who was not in the favor of the party. And the problem is if they start from A and the other one starts from B, in the end, there is nothing there for the tribunal to decide on. If you get the party appointed, if you get at least a joint agreement on the starting point and from there develop where you want to go, there is a major advantage and cost saving in arbitration. Cost saving in arbitration is one of the issues why I would recommend tribunal appointed experts because if you anyway end up with a tribunal appointed expert after you have heard the party appointed experts, then why not have the parties agree at the beginning on a tribunal appointed expert schedule and then have just one expert? There are another issue which also comes up. If you have tribunal appointed experts, most parties will appoint or will approach several experts. And there are a number of markets where you have a very small pool of potential experts. And very often you approach the first expert, the first expert is not really happy with the position. You want him to or her to present in an arbitration, so you have to appoint, you have to approach another one. But this first expert is probably already burned for the arbitration, and I think everyone in this room has sat in arbitrations where they try to find someone who is able to do damage calculation which has not connections with any of the parties. So if you burn at least four potential experts by one appointed by the party, one questioned or at least retained by the party at some time, there is at the end only the second class expert left. There is an additional point which also comes in favor of a tribunal appointed expert is that if you have a party appointed expert from the beginning, you will focus primarily on the two different positions of the experts. And it's much more difficult in the end to remove this wrong starting point, bringing it together to a joint starting point, where the parties at the beginning do not know whether the starting point this expert is taking will lead in one direction or the other direction. So my experience with the tribunal appointed experts was always that in the end, we were, it was much easier for us as a tribunal to decide um, with a tribunal appointed expert than having just two party appointed experts presenting themselves, presenting completely opposite views. In the case at hand, we had one of the rare cases where, or the, the moot court case, where there was no expert appointed yet. The problem is that very often you have already, with the first submission, a party-appointed expert, the first expert report. 
But this expert writes an expert report knowing that there will be another expert report coming thereafter when he or she has to rebut the expert report by the other side. And then, if you have then the two positions completely opposite, it's very difficult also very often for the party-appointed experts to agree on anything because they have presented their views already in two expert reports. So if I would agree on party-appointed experts, I would at least after the first round of submissions sit down and agree on a joint program for both party-appointed experts to see at least whether they can agree on the basic procedure, uh, the accounting method to be used or whatever, or explain to us why they follow a particular approach and then we give them as a tribunal guidance which approach they should follow that we don't have, again, two ships crossing at night. Um, and with that, I rest my case for now. <laughs> Before I allow um, Ms. Miles a short reply, one point I'm interested in your view on, uh, Professor Cole, is the suggestion from Ms. Miles that there is an absolute right for parties to uh, adduce evidence from their own appointed experts. And what do you say to that? I completely agree. Parties can do in an arbitration whatever they want. They have to present their case. But the question is, you want to make it efficient. If you indicate from the beginning to the parties that they may have the expert, they probably need the expert later on to question the tribunal appointed expert, that, but you will appoint an expert yourself. They will appoint, they will not invest in two party appointed expert opinions. They will appoint in an ex, or they will invest in an expert helping them to question the tribunal appointed expert to draft the terms of reference for the tribunal appointed expert. And when Ms. Miles started to discuss the EBA rules, the funny thing is if you look at the EBA rules, yes, she is right. But if you look at the at all the other arbitration rules, the arbitration laws, they regulate challenge of arbitrators, challenge of party appointed experts, because they have to be, sorry, challenge of tribunal appointed experts. They have to be independent and impartial. They do not regulate the challenge of party appointed experts because everyone knows that they are never independent and impartial. And there has been, you were quoting Mr. Doug Jones, there has been someone who said it's naive to believe that they will be independent or impartial. Okay, Ms. Haas. Are they always hired guns, always supporting their nominating party's case? That is seem pretty passionate to me. <laughs> the... Um, the um, so the IBA rules, the amended IBA rules, 2014, I think was the date, they, they were amended to include for the party appointed arbitrators a statement of independence and impartiality, which never used to be there. And I do think that is one of the reasons, and this goes to your point and in fact concedes the point, that's one of the reasons why I think parties now tend more to agree to the rules on the IBA taking of evidence as guidelines and not as rules. Because in certain areas of expertise, and perhaps this case is one area, there aren't that many experts that can really deal with the issue. And it may well be, if it's a particular area of technology, that the experts have all at one time or another worked for one or other of the parties. So they may well be impartial, but they're not independent. They could be the former chief engineer so on the pension. So they're not independent of the parties, but they may still be impartial. So the IBA rules do require a statement of impartiality and independence. The IBA rules and actually nothing else in arbitration has an equivalent to our white book rules, the CPR rule 35, where the, the expert um, affirmatively must state and agree and commit I really hope that's not my car. Dear Lord, hacking. <laughs> You'd be the only room, person in the room I'd forgive. Uh, the, <laughs> don't take it, though. <laughs> the, um, th those rules, you, one owes a the expert actually owes a duty to the court. Over and above the duty to the parties, a duty to the court. But are they hired guns? Sometimes, yes. Are good ones hired guns? Never. Are effective ones hired guns? Never. 
Effective ones are helping the arbitrators to get to the resolution of the dispute. Obviously, you're not going to appoint them if getting to the resolution of the dispute means you're going to lose. Your job is not to lose as counsel, obviously. Um, but, but if they can help you get to settlement, then perhaps they are doing their job. The, um, so the IBA rules do have that commitment. I just want to come back. on the, 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 So the question was, are they high guns? Sometimes, but, but, but they shouldn't be. The... Um, an party-appointed expert ultimately may not agree with the party that appointed her on all points. So that is where the experts are really doing their job, where they're finding the areas of agreement. So I do think, I mean, our... May I shortly interrupt you? Would you then present that expert if they don't agree with you on all points? Would you then appoint that expert if you don't agree with you on all... Um, it present, on, it, present. It, it depends, of course. I mean, the lawyers answer to everything. But, but it, it really does. I mean, if it's a, if it's a deal breaker of a point, probably not. But, but if it's points in the margins, as is usually the case, these, these experts, you don't need an expert unless the technical issues in dispute are difficult and complicated and not within your experience and the lawyer's experience and the arbitrator's experience. But I do agree with you that we need, in the use of experts in international arbitration, as in judicial proceedings, in all systems, a process-driven solution. So we need to find a way to get the experts on the same page and looking to, to um, participate in the same process of helping the arbitrators uh, resolve the dispute. Now, I don't think you have to have a party, a tribunal appointed expert to achieve that. I think party appointed experts driven properly, like a car, can actually get to that process driven solution as well. Early mutual engagement is one way to achieve that. Identifications of the areas in dispute, another way. Identification of the materiality of areas in dispute. There might be a whole lot in dispute that goes to technical issues and very little that might be material. Uh, identification, articulation of the reasons for agreement, listing of assumptions. It's all very well for the conclusions to be different, but are the assumptions underlying those conclusions the same? Identification of evidence um, relevant to the outstanding dispute. So what are the facts and issue that are reform informing the respective parties' conclusions? A roadmap to resolving the disputes, a roadmap for the expert, for the party appointed expert, so they're going along the same process and to help the arbitrators. And this is one of the things that I think between the lines appeals to arbitrators about a tribunal appointed expert is if you can get the party appointed experts working with the parties to create a proper record. So rather than file 20 binders of supporting documents that nobody's ever going to look at, focus on what really goes to the issues in these reports. And then compliance with the impartiality and the independence requirement. Hired guns are just a waste of time and a waste of money. And finally, on the arbitrators, case management. You don't need your own tribunal-appointed expert to manage the process. You can, you can be proactive in managing the party-appointed expert. And, and last in the process-driven approach is creativity, ingenuity, internationality, in the approach to cross-examination. So that can include things like hot tubbing, bringing the ex-party appointed experts together and really having an opportunity to, to bring them into resolving the same issues and same disputes. Now, I uh, just want you to think about whether you need a, a very, very short rebuttal, Professor Cole. One, one point of order after me explaining the factual scenario Neither of you have actually based your submissions on the defective turbines. So I'm going to give you each one opportunity to give me a good reason why we should have a tribunal appointed um, expert in this case, or party appointed experts, to work out whether these turbines are likely to uh, be susceptible to corrosion and cavitation damage. Just one short point. Ms. Miles mentioned that uh, hired guns are useless 
waste of time and waste of money. And as I said, I believe that most of the time the party appointed expert is a hired gun. So that is largely a waste of money, waste of time, and waste of effort. But now looking at our case again, we have here two problems, corrosion and cavitation. They may be related, but one is a more chemical issue, the other one is a more physical issue, uh, the cavitation part. Uh, the chemical, the corrosion part, so you might need two separate experts. In this case here, we had no party appointed expert yet. And with the corrosion problem, with the physical problem, that is one at least what I learned in my arbitration from these first two party appointed experts and then later the uh, tribunal appointed expert, that is something where largely an expert can tell you whatever they want because very often they don't know themselves how it properly works. That was one of the outcome of, in the end, having all three experts sitting there that they said, in the end, we don't 100% understand why we have cavitation there in these type of turbines. Uh, we know what it is, we know how it works, but how you really manage that, there are different approaches to that. If we had the tribunal appointed experts at the beginning, he would have been able to tell us from the beginning, I can write you an expert opinion, but if there are certain questions coming from the party appointed experts, I would have to admit, and I can easily admit, the two party appointed experts, they wrote two party appointed expert opinions, only in the end later on to agree with the tribunal appointed expert. That is an area where you have problems. Corrosion is something different. Uh, corrosion is a chemical process where you probably, it's easier to explain why you have corrosion. And again here, I would say um, once you have decided to go one road, why change it and have prolonged the process? I would agree with Ms. Miles. To a certain extent, you should not have the worst of both approaches, but stick to one approach and help to make it work properly. The best would not really be to have the best of both approaches, but there is a question, tribunal or party appointed experts here, that's you have to decide one way or another. So you think we're going to end up with six experts overall? We, presumably the tribunal would need two to experts that would well. be That would be it, or at least in the case we ended up with five. <laughs> so that's a concession. Ms. Marr, anything to add? Well, two things. First, having listened very carefully to Professor Kroll, I, uh, I know for sure I need a party appointed expert to understand the difference between corrosion and cavitation. But we know from the facts that the existence of corrosion is not an issue. We know from the facts that the, the existence of cavitation is not an issue. And we know from the facts that the, the temporal, the timing, two years are, of operation, is also not an issue. What is an issue is whether that corrosion and cavitation after two years was excessive. And what is an issue is whether it was resulting from the manufacture of inferior steel and whether that steel was susceptible. So those are evaluative issues. They're not issues of, of is, does a scientific proven condition exist or not, but what is the degree? What, it, what is the level and degree? And those are evaluative decisions, and the parties will have different views on that and different factors feeding into that. And I think for that reason, on these particular facts, it goes strongly towards party appointed. Uh, I, I, I'm not sure you're right in saying that there is evidence of corrosion and cavitation damage as yet, and it could be both. But leaving that to one side, uh, will the tribunal not be assisted by having their own expert help them understand these chemical and physical damage issues? So if, if the tribunal doesn't understand those issues properly as a result of the party appointed experts. Those party appointed experts and their appointing counsel are not doing their job properly. I intend, Madam Chair, to do my job properly. 
But that said, the question we're debating tonight is whether there should be party, uh, tribunal appointed instead of party appointed. If we are to debate whether there should be both, that would be a different issue. And if there were to be, in order to prevent the, the proliferation of experts outnumbering lawyers in the room, which may not be a bad thing to resolving the dispute, but it, um, you would need to narrow the issues that that tribunal mm. expert was going to deal with, and only party-appointed experts could do that. And just a, a one clarification. Ms. Mars has just pointed to the fact that the actual motion was uh, an alternative, whereas I think, Professor Kroll, you've accepted that the parties are entitled to have their own experts, but did you mean that those experts are allowed to serve expert reports, or are they just in the background helping the parties? For me, it was more than in the background helping the parties, advising the parties. I think no party, the parties have a certain amount of knowledge within the company, um, and that amount helps them to write the request for arbitration or, and the answer to that. But the moment you start discussing issues, yeah, you might need external evidence, or sorry, external uh, expertise to guide you what are the real questions you have to ask, whatever. That is completely up to the parties. But I think if you pay the expert by the hour advising you something, or if you pay an expert report, uh, that is a major cost difference. Yeah? Sitting as an arbitrator, sometimes I wish I would be the expert uh, in the room there. Uh, um, so well, we might have a few experts here who have a view on that later, <laughs> but we'll see. But um, that is, naturally, you need the expertise Either you have it or you have to hire it for preparing a case. I completely agree with that. The only c difference between the two of us is the role they should play. And um, when you were always referring to the IBA rules, uh, you're probably aware that there is also the Prague rules, yeah, uh, which have been developed by the civil law side, which were unhappy with the IBA rules. Uh, with too much experts, uh, party-appointed experts, too much cross-examination. And you rightly said, cross-examination, we have to internationalize it. You will hear civil lawyers would say, we don't need it at all. So that is the, the difference in approach. Right. Well, hold on to your thoughts about this issue, because I'm going to move to the second topic now, otherwise I'd be worried we wouldn't actually finish. And then we'll take any points that you want to raise before I uh, give my decision at the end. So we're going to move to the timing of expert evidence now. It should be at the beginning, later in the proceedings. And Professor Cole, perhaps you kick off this one. Um, as I said, and it follows a little bit from my, my presentation, um, that the parties need uh, internal expertise to write a proper statement of claim. But I think as early as possible, the tribunal should sit down and agree with the parties uh, on how we are going to treat expert evidence. And before we have um, two ships passing at night um, during several submissions, I would say after the first proper submission, you should as a tribunal, get engaged in expert, uh, expert evidence, basically writing terms of reference for the expert. The problem is sometimes in these cases, you have it that after the first submission, no one in the room really understands what is completely going on, and you need a second submission. Uh, that depends on, on each case. But my point would be as early as possible again, to save time. And we had, probably a lot of you have read the submission by one of the German partners of Baker McKenzie that we are now f facing a problem that we have cases which are, from the size they have, unable to be really treated by a tribunal. If you have submissions of 1,400 pages plus 40 binders, as she rightly said, who is going to read that? So I think if you as a tribunal take a proactive approach early onwards and tell the parties at an early point in time that is the way we're going to, to proceed with the expert and 
uh, I think you can save time and money. Um, maybe some of these cases you cannot dispute until the smallest piece there. And yes, I just sometimes have to say there's an economic solution and take a proper stance as a tribunal and avoid the due process paranoia to a certain extent. So I have a question before we, we move to Ms. Mars. I, what I understand you to be saying is there should be early assessment of how the expert evidence should be uh, adduced. But what do you say on the question of whether or not, in a case like this, where there's, it, it certainly seems that there's no um, obvious evidence of damage yet in the turbines, whether the expert evidence should actually precede the statements of case? Here we had a request for arbitration and an answer to that. So no proper statement of case. Uh, uh, that's what the students had to do in, the, in that here. Um, that's a really odd case here because the turbines, no one had a look at the turbines. No one even knew whether they were damaged. It was just the threat that there was a damage. Yeah? And the expert, the only thing the expert could do is evaluate how large is the threat there is, that there is a damage, and does it justify preparing everything to remove them immediately instead of just opening it up, taking them out, investigating, and then spending another time preparing and repairing them. So that's a really extraordinary case here. Um, in this case, I would say um, you only need a tribunal-appointed expert who evaluates the likelihood that there is um, that there is uh, corrosion or cavitation, because there's nothing to examine at present. And, uh, would, and would you in um, or, have that happen before the parties make submissions? I would, in that case, I would advocate even have that before the parties make a submission, further submission on that. Ms. Mars. The, Madam Chair, as you, as you just um, clarified, the, the, the motion is should expert evidence be made available in the early stages before legal submissions, before factual evidence. So where we sit now in the moot. And this from my side would be much quicker. The answer to that is no, period. The role of expert opinions is to give an opinion on the fact. We, we have the barest of facts and absolutely no evidence to substantiate those facts, and many of those facts are an issue. So for an independent expert to give an opinion on disputed facts, that um, would be elevating that expert opinion to a fact-finding role, which is not the purpose of expert evidence. I like the proposal Professor Kroll put forward. I don't think it puts the motion in his favor, but I think it's a novel and interesting solution is to introduce some form of dispute resolution mechanism prior to the arbitration or even within the arbitration where a kind of expert determination takes place perhaps similar to what an emergency arbitrator would do, an expert determination takes place. In terms of the evidentiary nature of the expert determination, the parties could agree that. But that's not an expert, a party-appointed expert in the terms that we've been debating as the IBA rules envisage. That is not giving an opinion on the facts because we don't have the facts. And I don't think we should ever have that role before we have the facts. But in order to find a neutral specialist to ascertain irrefutable facts once you look, is the dress red, go and open the wardrobe and have a look. Don't appoint a colorblind expert. But if, if it's a simple fact like that that has a yes, no answer, then, then all for that. And I think that's um, the point I wanted to make in the context of this particular dispute, which deals with scientific issues, with chemical issues, it's a renewable related dispute. It's a decarbonization transition related dispute. Um, reduction of emissions is at its heart. And this is the world that we now live in 
This is the world that our Vismut community is going to be operating in almost exclusively, and us as well. And there are going to be scientific issues going to the heart of decarbonisation disputes across the board. <clears throat> and there are scientific facts. There are facts of science that are known. There is consensus on certain scientific facts. We know the troposphere sits under the stratosphere. That's why we know that the Earth is warming from the bottom up, not from the sun down. Now, Justice Scalia didn't want to know that in, in, the, in the Supreme Court in the US a few years back, but those sorts of scientific, what we know, what is scientifically known and in consensus, then we should be able to put the tribunal in a position where it can take judicial notice of that science. So if a thing is corroded or not, if that can be ascertained, a yes, no, that should be taken off the table. Someone just go in and do that. The opinion goes to, is it excessive? Is it caused by the inferior steel manufacturer? Those things have to be subject to the fact evidence. And so, so that I understand your submission, Ms. Mars, the someone who goes in and assesses the fact evidence, could that not be a, a, a tribunal appointed expert at the beginning with party uh, appointed experts if necessary attending the inspection of the turbines? Well, it could be anything you want it to be, but it, it, I don't think that would be an efficient um, way to use the process. I think if, if one were going to ascertain, easily ascertainable technical facts um, is a thing A or B, and that is easily ascertainable as Professor Kroll suggests, then there is a role for an expert determination type function to, to go and assess that. And that could be taken off the tables. If the parties could agree to that, then that could be taken off the table. And I think that's the sort of thing we should do a whole lot more of. Well, we all know that parties don't tend to agree no. these things once they start. And importing an expert determination within the arbitration might be a bit much. But um, anyway, let, let's, without me expressing the view yet, yeah. Professor Cole, do you want a short reply? Um, short reply. In that case, I think it makes a major difference if you have three experts going to taking out the turbine. And in the case, the turbine wasn't taken out. They, 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 it was much earlier, and the question was just evaluating how high is the danger that the turbine has corrosion cavitation on the basis of the facts they had. But if you take three experts going to the turbine, looking at the turbine, I think it makes a major difference if you had two experts which had already written a report, which are in a position that they have to re defend the positions they have taken at a particular point in time. Instead of having three experts going there, there's a tribunal appointed expert which has asked questions by the other experts uh, which have not taken a position, which have not, whose position has not been the basis of a submission of a party. Therefore, I think it makes sense to have in these type of cases the tribunal appointed experts looking at it jointly with the party appointed experts that they agree what is the basic uh, method we are in examining the, of the corrosion, what are the various issues, and then the tribunal appointed experts does his or her work on the basis of the terms of reference agreed with the party appointed experts. Anything else? <laughs> I mean, if we're talking about a root cause analysis exercise, that, that seems to me not to be the role of experts appointed in an international arbitration proceeding. If, if, if somebody needs to go in and just look and see is there corrosion or isn't no, there no. corrosion, someone should do that. Um, but it's, it's, the, it's the more um, evaluative issues around that. If there is, is it excessive, isn't it excessive? Um, and, and what was the cause of it? Why is it there? Is it a design defect? Is it a metallurgical issue? All of that would then be subject to the reports. But if there's a preliminary question, open it up and have a look and see if there's corrosion or not, then, then that seems to me not to be a matter for party or tribunal expert opinions. That seems to me a fact that needs to be ascertained. And it might be a fact that needs to be ascertained by somebody who recognizes what corrosion is and isn't. But it seems to me a fact that could be ascertained. We completely agree. I'm mis probably mispronounced it a little bit. I meant 
They look at it and the expert determines what is the cause of the corrosion and what is the, um, what is the, uh, yeah, the extent of the corrosion in comparison to what you would normally expect. Yeah, so the evaluative part, not that the expert just looks at it and says there is corrosion. Yeah. I see. I see. Well, then I maintain my original point that that shouldn't be done until the facts are reduced. Right. So I'm going to open it up to the floor now. Does anyone have any points or questions they'd like to make? Coronavirus is not slowing you down. One behind you. Uh, Jeremy Nicholson, uh, and I own up to being a very common lawyer. A question for Professor Kroll. Uh, isn't the problem with a tribunal appointed expert that the tribunal then gets only one opinion uh, and uh, the tribunal then has very little choice? Whereas if there are party appointed experts, uh, then the tribunal has at least two sets of opinions to explore and more importantly, the reasons for their opinions. Yeah. Very valid point. Um, that is the for me, the uh, opportunity in a hearing, expert hearing, you come and question the view of the expert. And as a tribunal, your view then is to hear the cross-examination or the examination of the expert by the parties, by the party-appointed expert, and then base your decision later on on what you think was can stand or cannot stand. The parties will anyway present already in one way or another their views in the submissions. They will say, I believe there is excessive corrosion. The other will say there is no excessive corrosion. If there is excessive corrosion, it has to do with the construction of the, uh, or the water you use or whatever. Yeah, um, so you have the different views in the submissions and you get the different views through the questioning of the tribunal appointed expert. Okay. Do you have another question? Um, there's a gentleman in the middle with a striped shirt. Thank you. <coughs> Professor, my question is that we advocate often the parties' autonomy in the uh, arbitration. But the first thing is that are the parties are so expert to identify appropriate uh, expert which to can identify a problems because sometimes parties are not very well in appointing uh, arbitrators and that may happen so many times. And the second point is that, Mike, uh, why the parties are not agree for a joint expert? Because the, uh, the base mechanism of arbitration is there to save the cost and time. So the first, the first point is that why they are not agree for a joint uh, expert rather than they are appointing a separate expert. If the parties appoint a joint expert, great. Yeah. I don't have to do any work as a tribunal. Yeah. If they can agree on an expert, it's very helpful for me. I think the issue here was more that if the parties come with their party appointed experts, uh, should we say, OK, we insist or we let them write not only one expert opinion but two expert opinions? Or should we say at a certain point in time, we have read the first expert opinion, let's now try to get now a joint expert? or let's try to agree on something that the next expert opinion is useful for the tribunal and not just presenting the position of the party again. Uh, Ms. Miles, I think you might have something to if say. If parties can agree a joint expert, they probably don't need us. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yes, I think by the time the disputes ar ar arisen, the parties are very unlikely to agree on the same expert. Do you have someone from the back? Whoever you can get the uh, mic to. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Michael Patrick Joyce. I'd like to go back to a phrase that Stefan Kroll has used on a couple of occasions, which is ships passing in the night. So uh, this is really a situation where you have expert one starting at point A and getting to conclusion B, and expert two starting at point C and getting to conclusion D. Now, if you're putting a tribunal in the position of having to appoint an expert, surely you're asking a tribunal to perform completely impossible mental gymnastics in those circumstances. So the 
conclusion would tend to indicate that the civil law approach fails. But then if one looks at the common law approach and one simply lets expert one start from point A and expert two start from point C, all you're doing is storing up very great problems further down the line. So the logic of that conclusion is that the common law approach fails. So both approaches fail catastrophically. Where have I gone wrong? <laughs> I was worried you were going to be overly common law orientated then, but I like the missile towards Miss Miles at the end. So do you want to go first this the, time? Um, so I shamelessly plagiarized Mr. Justice Green and his judgment in British American Tobacco and the Department of Health. Um, a judicial review decision in the High Court, um, Queen's Bench in 2016. And those factors that um, I laid out in reply, early engagement, um, um, early mutual engagement and agreement on the areas, that's precisely to prevent that happening. If all experts are doing is creating more confusion and more uncertainty, they have no place in the arbitration. And if as a respondent, tactically, that's what you're trying to do to stop a successful claim against you, frankly, you have no, no place in arbitration. That's not what we're there for. We're there to resolve disputes. Yes, we're there to win, but we're there to resolve disputes, and particularly disputes like this that do go to energy transition, which, which frankly, we've all got to win at. You know, um, we're, we're actually all on the same team on that one. So getting to the answer on the technical issue should be our collective objective. Your damages, maybe there's a lot more horse trading in it, but, but when it comes to technical issues, scientific technical issues, we ought to be able to do this. Professor Kroll, does the tribunal expert process fail? It, it all depends on the arbitrators you get. <laughs> <laughs> so there's some very good at gymnastics, yeah, and some may not be as good. Uh, now, I agree that as an arbitrator, if you just get a bare statement of claim uh, or request for arbitration and an answer to that, it's largely impossible for you to appoint an expert yeah? because here in that case we had cavitation and corrosion. And as I said, in the case we needed two separate experts for that. And you don't know really what is the relevant part there. And you. At that st stage, we didn't understand what cavitation was actually, uh, why it was so relevant here. So at that stage, you can only start looking at it once you have a proper statement of claim and a proper answer to that. And then I think the process of sitting down and trying to agree on the terms of reference for an expert is something where you have an input from the party appointed experts which have not written a proper submission on or not proper report on expert report but which help to write down to set down the um, terms of reference for the tribunal appointed expert. So I think there is a chance of going wrong but I think with the common law approach the chance is higher. Right, we've got chance for one or two more comments. We have a young lady here actually just a spice it up a little bit, I hope. Good evening, all. Thank you for your presentations. I had a question for Ms. Miles, actually. I'm a common law student, but I was brought up in a civil law country. And you spoke a great deal about efficiency and the importance of reducing the costs of proceedings. And my question was to do with the fact um, of private justice and equality of arms. In a situation where a party might not be able to exercise its, auto its autonomy properly because of either being near liquidation or simply not having, as Sir Ethelbert quoted, the ability to conduct mental gymnastics, is it not appealing to have one tribunal-appointed expert from that perspective? And if you disagree, then what is your um, judgment on the impact that this has on equality of arms or fairness or justice, as you put it? I think my answer is third-party funding, but um, <laughs> <laughs> the, no, I, I joke. We're, we're now out of debate mode, aren't we? I, I haven't mean, made my, delivered oh, my decision oh, yet, so I would I tread carefully. Then. I will <laughs> tread carefully. I don't think we're as divided as we seem between common law and civil law, um, and I think that's pretty much the conclusion everyone should be drawing. 
we're all trying to get to an efficient outcome. I don't think um, necessarily a tribunal appointed expert will overcome the issue you identify. Parties are going to make submissions to the tribunal as to whom they will appoint. Parties are going to do due diligence, due diligence. they're going to interview. So the, the better armed party is probably going to have more influence in the selection of that expert. And if there is such an equality of arms, chances are the better armed party, probably the claimant in this case, is going to be paying for the tribunal and paying for the expert. And so the optics of that are never wonderful either. So I, I'm not sure it actually overcomes an issue that you rightly identify as a very real issue. I think we need to look at other solutions. I don't think this is one. Um, and of course, experts can't act on contingency, so. Any comments on cost? I completely agree that you cannot overcome that problem, but at least you have someone who is helping you, the tribunal there who is taking a kind of neutral position. So the likelihood that the inequality of arms plays a greater role uh, is smaller in, with a tribunal appointed expert, in my view. Um, that is also something if you have a party and we have a narrow market uh, of potential experts. As a party, I would just, with a better knowledge about the issues, whatever, I would just approach all the good experts give them some information, and then hire one of them, and the other one's out. So um, if the now tribunal from the beginning is involved, uh, there is no point in doing that. OK. Um, I'm wondering whether the, oh, there's a hand shot up very vigorously at the back. So one last comment. Good evening, everyone. First of all, if we are too late, it's fine, I can but I have just one comment. I'm coming from a civil law jurisdiction, the most rigid civil law jurisdiction, okay? I'm coming from Dubai. Where? From where? From Dubai. Dubai? Dubai, yeah. A civil law jurisdiction, very rigid one among other civil law jurisdictions. However, taking the rights of the parties to appoint their own experts to help them to present their case, especially on technical issues, I see that as an extreme, extremely extreme position. The tribunal under the IBA rules can, if feels that, first of all, I do agree with you, there is no party appointed expert, neutral or independent. They are hired guns. But that's the role of the tribunal here, that's the role of the tribunal to balance or evaluate. Here we need to know who is deciding on the dispute is not the expert is the tribunal who can balance and evaluate the two opinions. If they see that they are too extremely biased, the tribunal can appoint its own expert under the IBA rules. On the other hand, from my experience, the tribunal appointed expert, which is like the judge appointed expert in our cases, punch bag for the parties. And the tribunal and the parties, the tribunal like the parties arbitrators, they are not really technical. They don't know really if the parties are right with their criticism to that expert or not. So it's better always, and by law or under any kind of rules, there is no way to take from the parties their right to appoint their own expert and to put it from the beginning in the terms of reference that you cannot appoint your own expert. Sorry if I understood wrong okay. the issue or Thank no, you. no, it's, I completely agree. There's no right to take it away. Yeah? The only question is, what do you do with the cost later on? Yeah? You can still, as an arbitrator, say um, there was, you have the right to appoint your own expert. You have the right also to question, or you need an expert to question the other expert. But I'm not, re I'm not giving you the cost for the two expert reports you have submitted there. To prevent someone from doing something in an arbitration that would probably always affect the right to be heard uh, and to present your case properly. And I think there is no disagreement between the two of us. The only question is what you sh should you do as a tribunal? And it's also fairly, uh, from a technical consideration, if the tribunal says we are going to appoint a tribunal-appointed expert and you keep sending in uh, 
party-appointed expert reports, there are a lot of arbitrators who don't like that. Let's put it that way. Uh, uh, they will look at it, yeah, but they say, we agree on a particular procedure. We have a procedure which is, at least if you look at the civil law side, not a violation of the right to be heard. Uh, you can submit an expert report, but how I'm going to deal with it, that is a question which is, in my view, within the tribunal's discretion. Well, oh, Professor Kroll, I think your passion is increasing as the evening has gone on, but I'm going to draw it to a close now, I'm afraid. Yeah. Um, and um, I, I actually thought the last gentleman's comment was very apposite and actually encapsulated what international arbitration is all about, and that's having a marriage of the civil and, and common law approaches. I've tried desperately hard to put my common law training to one side, but on topic one, I just cannot, I am afraid, be persuaded that there shouldn't be party-appointed experts who actually deliver evidence and expert reports, particularly in a case like this, which is so complicated on both the chemical and, and physical damage front. And now I'm going to commit one of the greatest sins in arbitration, split the baby in two, because in this case, I do think we need expert evidence up front. Is there any damage? We don't know yet. Let's inspect the turbines and find out. So there we go. And I hope that this, we have actually got a lot of students in the room. There are a lot more in the um, overflow room. So I hope they've enjoyed it as well. And I hope this will get them in the mood for the pre moot and uh, maybe just the moot now actually this weekend um, and I think it's a wonderful way for them to practice their skills and I was reminded recently of a quote from um, the art of war written by Sun Tzu in the fifth century BC in China which is this victorious warriors win first and then go to war while defeated warriors go to war first and then seek to win I'll let you all ponder that one. The next and the last thing I have to do this evening is actually to encourage you to stay for drinks. Those are going to be in the senior common room, one floor down on the fifth floor, and I'm assured there are going to be stewards in red LSE T-shirts to guide you on the way. So I hope no one is actually colorblind in the room, otherwise you might miss out on drinks. But please join me in thanking our debaters this evening. Sorry, sorry that I take the floor once more. I already interrupted you once. I apologize for that. Yeah, but that is something you do at the mood as well, trying to keep the other one off guard. The other thing why, which I would like to announce, we heard that we had to cancel the physical mood. We will try to have an online mood, and we are desperately looking for that one also for arbitrators. So we would be very happy to have people volunteering to arbitrate also online. We know that the experience is not as interesting as doing it in real life in persona. But if we want to offer that to the students, we need people who are willing to take off two or four hours of their time sitting in front of a computer and trying to um, give some feedback to the students. And this will not be the last mood. Next year there will be a mood, and though I was vigorously defending civil law, we are really interested in getting more common law arbitrators, uh, and in particular also female common law arbitrators. Yeah? If you tick the two boxes, civil law, uh, sorry, common law and female, you have a <laughs> chair guaranteed, largely. Yeah? So, I hope to see many of you either online this year or next year in person in Vienna. And thank you, Jackie, for organizing that.